order, 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 order. The House will show its appreciation in a way other than clapping. Order, order, order. The convention that we don't clap in this chamber is very, very, very long established and widely respected. To vote for this motion tonight. Kevin, um, if there's a yes vote, you'll move your warehouse operations to the UK, I understand, the rest that's, of the UK. That's correct. Why? What are you afraid of? It's been about saying, basically, we're too small, we're too little, we're too inconsequential. We can't do what we want. I don't know why anybody would want to run a country like this. This country is the greatest on earth, not because it's the biggest and it's the strongest, but because it has the most brilliant people. You know, it's the free market was designed sure. by a Scotsman. You know, we have the Everything English language. Everything was designed by a Scotsman. Well, you know, I'm a Scot. I'm confident about the outcome of that referendum, and I'll be campaigning to remain in the European Union, as anyone with any brain cells uh, will also be doing. Indeed, I think Scotland's another country. Um, and I actually do think we will move to a position where you have independence and I hope we will then push for a uh, parliament of uh, all the re of all the countries with uh, England having its sovereign parliament like you have, Wales and Northern Ireland. So, I mean, but people in Scotland are voting for bigger issues than what they have to face, which is again the, the, a key for our future on the referendum. Right, well, let's totally well, disarm me by that proposal. Right. Which of course let's I just, have to support. just let brief. Um, we're just looking at those figures on that. By our reckoning, you and we're up eight point. What the Conservatives are up by eight point one percent. We'll have lots of figures flying about. Okay, there seems to be some problem with this. I've interviewed David Cameron last Thursday, and he's clearly going soft on, on doing that. He's he, going soft, yeah. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what he's if, doing. If, he's if, going soft. So he's you made think of the, jelly. If Donald Trump... Many of those who are arguing that we should remain are trying to frighten you by saying that it would be impossible for Britain to succeed. They're saying that Britain is too small, too poor, and we're all too stupid to be able to succeed on the outside. And I think that we're uniquely fortunate to live in the best country in the world. And it's because I think this country is so great and because I believe its people are so wonderful. But the, the, the Norwegians say to me, you know, they, they've said to me very clearly, if you want to uh, play a part in Europe, play a part in Europe. If you want to be run by Europe, have our position, because they basically take dictation about what the rules are. You know, I That's want the, the best Norwegian for our... elite. It's not the ordinary Norwegian people who are doing pretty well at the moment. Well, they have an enormous... They have as much oil as we do, and only 4 yeah, million people yeah. rather than it 60 helps. million Agreed. people, so that Agreed. makes a difference. Yeah, it is the end for the Labour Party. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the end, and it either comes quickly or it comes slowly, but it's the end. There's no doubt that Corbyn will win this leadership election. There's no doubt that then his supporters will start to deselect sensible members of the Parliamentary Labour Party in revenge against them. And actually, in the end, that will be futile because the electorate will deselect uh, large swathes of Labour MPs. Uh, and the choice for anybody who believes in centre-left progressive politics is how to detach themselves, not just from the corpse of the Labour movement, which is what the trade unions are, but from the corpse of the Labour Party. What I've said to Nicola Sturgeon and, and the discussions I've had with uh, the Scottish Government is that I want them to be fully involved, involved fully engaged in the discussions uh, that we're having about the position the United Kingdom's going to take and, and the other devolved administrations as well. What, you know, the people of the United Kingdom took a decision to leave the European Union. What I want to do is make a success of it. And what I say to the people in Scotland is I want to ensure that that's a success for people in Scotland. Jackson Coroner. Um, there will be time uh, to debate the wider content of the statement next week, but suffice to say today, that was one of the most belligerent and if calculated to enhance Scotland's immediate influence, self-defeating statements from any First Minister. During our, busy, during our busy summer tours, can the First Minister, for the avoidance of doubt, confirm which EU member state heads of government with whom she has not met or spoken directly since June the 23rd? And is she just, to paraphrase her own words earlier this afternoon, and as our tone today suggests, destined to define herself as a window shopper in these negotiations? First Minister. Well, I think actually the tone and the, the lack of any substance in that question really does expose, really does expose uh, just how little detail or substance there is in the Conservative position on this at all. And let me say, 
to Jackson Carlaw without a single word of apology. When it comes to standing up for Scotland's interests, I do get pretty belligerent because that's my job as First Minister, is to stand up for the interests of this country. And right now, right now, the interests of this country are under threat because of the actions of the Conservative government at Westminster. And somebody needs to stand up for yeah. Scotland, and that's the job of this government. What T Tony Blair always tried to do was to understand that most people are not living in the political bubble that yeah. we live in. And I think he always had an understanding of that. And I think there's a real danger at the moment that we're losing that. I think that we need to be quite clear that that was a decisive vote by the people of Scotland to remain in the EU. Now, um, you play, sir, in a Scots accent, and you supported the nationalist cause <laughs> during the last referendum. How do you now feel about it all after Brexit, look at, looking at that whole episode? We have Brexit. We have, which is in effect, uh, English independence. Uh, and Eng England is taking, it wants to take Scotland and Northern Ireland with it. It's already got Wales because they voted Brexit. Now, Scotland, Scotland has only since the war, since Attlee's government, it has only received the, the uh, government it voted for twice since the war. That's not democracy. In order to, to achieve democracy, Scotland should be independent. It, 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 Scotland is a country that is uh, an oil producing country about the same size as Denmark. And so you see a second referendum as essential after Brexit? It's essential, absolutely essential. To, uh, to, to, to shy away from that is, is undemocratic. Ken Stott, thank you very much indeed <laughs> for talking to us. It's a pleasure. And I think it's exactly because we came third in Scotland this year that people should listen to what I have to say about the future of the party. Uh, as quickly as, as possible. Um, I, again, it's sort of moving beyond the realms of this committee, but my own, my own view is whatever happens post-Brexit, the relationship between Scotland and England has been fractured further than it already it re really was and that the there's an argument now if not for independence at the very least maximum uh devolution of, of powers and we need a, a you know even beyond the diva max we got post the uh, independence referendum we need a further uh, movement of powers to, to scotland is the only way of actually keeping uh, the relationship uh, workable i know Many people don't want to keep it workable, but if you want to keep it workable, I think maximum devolution is now the only the only option. Scotland clearly has indicated that it has a different set of preferences from the bulk of the uh, of England, uh, not even the rest of the UK, but England, uh, and therefore, yeah, yeah. Again, I think we need to be looking at another constitutional settlement, and among that, I think labour and employment laws is a key element. Yes. Do you think you can take your colleagues in the Labour Party with you on that? Uh, no, I've been tr I've been desperately trying to walk on eggshells, not be part not be party political here. But actually, I think you might be surprised that there is a growing movement inside the the Labour Party as well that recognises that the, there is a a need for a, a new relationship. But not everybody agrees with that, of course. So is it solely down? Let me just be clear. Is it solely down to the Scottish government to come forward with these options? You are it's, the Secretary of State for Scotland. It's, Scotland it's, voted to remain in the EU. Isn't it your job to come up with some of these ideas? Uh, no, Gary. Scotland did not vote to remain in the EU. And we also know that Nicola Sturgeon has another option in her back pocket, and that's an independence referendum. If, if talk if, about the if, white working class in the I'm Labour very Party, happy to talk about, well, I'm very you are happy, now. I'm, I've always been happy uh, to talk about, and, I've, and I'm very strong that the Labour Party needs to be talking much more about English identity and Englishness, because if we are afraid of voicing love of country, if we are afraid of voicing patriotism, then people think we're not on their side. I'll give you another one. We're spending £25 million every single day on foreign aid, giving foreign aid to countries, in some cases, who are richer than ourselves. Barnet formula as well. That Barnet absolutely formula, needs absolutely. another look. Are you going to take money away from Scotland? Yeah, I think they get too much at the moment. All right. Uh, let's just get your personal taste. Salad cream or mayonnaise? Now, we can still keep this island of ours together and still gain control over all our Scottish taxes and how they are spent. Or we can just cut ourselves off. 
It's also going to dramatically change the political argument in Scotland because now the Scottish government can raise income tax. It's got the ability to generate more revenue. It can no longer blame the Westminster government for any spending cuts or budget constraints it comes under. Would you not rather that £6 million in your coffers, people paying a little bit more after a freeze of almost ten, 10 years? Well, here's a simpler answer. How are you being treated, Christian? I think it's been, uh, since Brexit, it's been incredible. It's been very, very, very difficult. Uh, I, 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 I'm on Twitter and I never... I, I never stop anybody on Twitter. I never blocked anybody in Twitter. Oh, by instance, you are blocking me. I don't know why, but uh, I, I, I had nobody. I blocked nobody in Twitter before after Brexit. I had. I even had to contact the police for for for, for one incident. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a great place. We are not in a so, great place. So people and, being and, abusive to you because of your nationality, Christian? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Lots of people say, "Oh, isn't it great that we're going to have this new trade agreement yeah. with America?" No trade agreement with America, however ambitious, can replace or match what we are potentially going to lose on our own doorstep in Europe. If, just, just, about, just dwell on this one statistic. If you double the trade with America, with Canada, with New Zealand, with Australia and India, double trade with all of those huge countries, mm-hmm. with all of the Anglosphere, you still would not trade as much as we do with our nearest neighbours in the European Union. The reason for that is because geography still counts. Yes. You tend to trade, countries tend to trade, m- most, in goods at least, but with countries nearest people, to them. But, I, I, you know, I think the, you know, Scotland's become a very different country and I think part of the genius of Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmon before is that they'd made these very hot issues, yep. uh, you know, about the, the national divide, yeah. which is fair enough. So we now know that there are missiles in Scotland that may go the wrong direction when well, they're fired. Well, well quite. <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so the, so the essence of trade deals is how much market have you got to offer the other side? So if Switzerland wants to go and have a trade deal with China, it says, here's our market, quite small, your market's enormous, we need a trade deal with you. And China says, as they've done, fine, you can give us completely open entry into your economy um, and we will open up for you to trade into ours in 15 years time. Now that's a deal, it's a deal you can do. That's the deal China did with Switzerland. So my point is that for Britain, you know, if everybody in the world believed in a free market as a matter of religious faith, Britain might have a chance, but that's not how trade negotiations work. Countries say, how big's your market? And that's the deal we'll do with you. And that's why Britain, as part of a European market of 500 million, is part of some very successful trade deals with more than 60 other countries. And that's Britain's market. Now, if Britain wants to try and negotiate those alone, there's two big problems. One, it will always be the rule taker. The big economies will always just dictate the terms. And second, it takes a lot of time. It takes, on average, 28 months to come up with a trade deal. And the reason that's important is all these flourishing sectors that Dan Hannon talked about, biotech, education, they need investment. Now, when investors decide they want to come to Britain, they want to know two things. They want certainty about what the rules are going to be, and they want a big market share. So if Britain says, well, we're not sure what we're going to have, it's going to take us a few years to negotiate, and we're not going to have access to a big market, Britain's got a problem. You are is a gross act of treachery for you to now try and break up the UK. I think I consider uh, that you are metaphorically spitting on those graves of the brave Scottish soldiers that gave their lives for the UK. Well, can I answer you in two ways? One is for my father, Chris, eh, who, unlike me or you, fought in the, the Second World War and is still alive and and going strong and asking home for ex servicemen. Uh, My father's been a Scottish nationalist longer than I've been alive. Uh, And I think, you know, on his behalf, he would find it uh, offensive that you questioning uh, either his wish to to fight against uh, Nazism in the the Second World War uh, in the Navy and also the idea that SNP supporters were somehow illegitimate in progressing our aims. And the second thing I say to you this, and this is really important, Chris, just remember it. The SNP and its forebears for the last hundred years, have pursued a policy of self-government or independence for Scotland. In that entire century, not a single person has lost their life arguing for or against Scottish independence. It's been pursued in a peaceful, civil, democratic fashion. 
Now, that's not unprecedented in the world, but it's a very, very rare thing indeed. So instead of banding about stupid terms like treachery and all the rest of it, start to respect the democratic ballot box techniques of the Scottish National Party, which are so admired, incidentally, around the planet, if not by you in Chichester. And I intend to take as much time as is my right to make my point. I think the Honourable Lady has come to an end. Can we have the Minister, please? Thank you, Mr Hoyer. Mr Salmon, you shall know better. Order. 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 One second. A point of order, Mr Salmon. It's quite clear that the Honourable Lady had not resumed her seat, sir. Being in the chair accords you many privileges, but you cannot reinterpret the wishes of an Honourable Member who is on her feet. Mr Summons, as the Chair, I have the right to make decisions on this House. Just a moment. What well, I would say is, quite rightly, I wanted to bring the Honourable Lady in, which I did. When the SNP whip comes and gives me an ask for me to give a couple of minutes to ensure that you've got another voice, which I did, I certainly don't expect advantages to be taken of the Chair on the agreement that I made. Oh, Mr. Wishart, calm down. It's a very serious matter. It's so serious that I want to hear what the Minister's got to say in, no, in response to where we are. I think it's very serious. I want to hear it. Oh, well, um, this is a hugely important debate. Oh, order! Mr. Sam, can I can you just clarify something for me? Tempers are running quite high. We need to just calm it down. In fairness, I've been very generous in coming into the chair. Order. I beg to report that the committee has gone through the bill and directed me to report the same without amendment. Point of order, Alex Salmon. Point of order, sir, the the, uh, government's refusal to accept a single amendment means there will be no report stage. The programme motion means there is no debate on third reading. I am informed by the Library that the last time that combination happened was the Defence of the Realm Act of 1914, which was about the First World War. For this to happen in any bill would be an abuse. To happen on this bill is an outrage. What is it about the procedures of this place that allow a bill of this constitutional significance to be railroaded through in this disgraceful fashion? What I can say is that the House agreed to a programme motion, and that is what's been adhered to. What, what, what I would say is, it's on the record, you've certainly pointed out last time it was used, what I would say to you is, there are other channels where I think that conversation ought to go to and to be taken up with. But I thank you for that. A point of our order, Jacob. Mr Deputy Speaker, this House has nobly represented the will of the British people in a referendum. Can I just say to the Honourable Member, who is a constitutional expert, would also recognise that is also definitely not a point of order.
Oh, 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 oh. Order! Miss Gibson, it's very good to you all the choir, but what I would say is, I personally don't mind singing, but I certainly can't allow it in the chamber. Because before we know it, we could hear other tunes, and I don't want to get into that. So, you know, and some of them haven't quite got the voice on this side of the chamber as what they might have on there. So please, I don't want to, I don't want to sing off within the chamber. It's very good of you, much appreciated, but if you can just leave it for a little while, it's been very tense week already. I just don't need any extra. Thank you. Margaret Ferrier. Carol, last week marked nine years since uh, the, the SNP scrapped the last of the transport tolls in Scotland. And since then, the average commuter travelling on the Forth and Tay bridges has saved around £2,000 each. In the same time period, the average toll paying commuter in England and Wales will have paid out just under £4,000. If the government is serious about helping what it calls just about managing families, why will the Secretary not reassess his transport toll policy? Well, my goodness, Mr Speaker, what bare-faced cheek from the SNP. They did indeed cancel the tolls, and, and they closed. The crossings closed as a result because they didn't have enough money. To, they didn't have enough money. They didn't have enough money to make them work. Well, points of order ordinarily come later, but if it flows from question time and is brief and not disputatious, <laughs> we'll hear it. Briefly, Margaret Ferrier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I seek your guidance. Um, in response to my earlier question, the Minister was suggesting that ending toll charges in Scotland had led to bridges in Scotland being closed. And, and in the instance of the fourth bridge, which was damaged, the bridge was repaired ahead of schedule. The Queen's Ferry crossing is being completed on time and significantly under budget without need for tolls. Maybe the Minister Hayes would like to take this opportunity to, to correct his earlier comments. I very much doubt that the Minister wishes to do so. The Honourable Lady, who is well informed and I imagine has a very good vocabulary, has just feigned ignorance of the word disputatious. I said her point of order should not be disputatious, but it was disputatious. So I think we will leave it there. I am not knowledgeable upon those matters to which she has referred, and more importantly, I have absolutely no responsibility for them myself, which is a great source of relief. And he's demonstrated that when he comes back onto the stage, people listen. Imagine if Gordon Brown had made a speech about the European Union today, tumbleweed. We wouldn't be talking about it. I wouldn't be going on TV tonight on various channels. It would just be tumbleweed. Tony Blair still captures our imagination because he says things that we can hear and he grabs our attention even when he maddens his opponents. You have to listen he's, to He's him. maddening his own side as well. You know, Caroline Flint, the MP for Don Valley, who is the most Blairite of Blairite MPs, she was saying, we don't want to hear this is actually unhelpful if we spend the next two years just talking about how to undo the referendum as opposed to trying to shape what Brexit looks like. Look, I think the fact is, as Tony was saying, the politics of the next couple of years will be about exposing to the public what the consequences of Brexit are. There is no shaping a good result out of leaving the single market and leaving the customs union. It's a fantasy if Caroline thinks that that is possible. Leslie Brennan, who's a Labour councillor in Dundee and who's recently been elected to the executive of the Scottish Labour Party. Well, first of all, uh, Leslie Brennan, your reaction to the remarks that Sadiq Khan has made this morning in the record newspaper? Sorry, I didn't actually. Sorry, I haven't actually seen the, oh, the well, comments. Oh, uh, let me read you what he says. He says there's no difference between those who try to divide us on the basis of whether we are English or Scottish, and those who try to divide us on the basis of our background, race, or religion. <clears throat> and on the front page of the Herald, the the headline that is Scottish nationalism is the same as racism. I, I would say that the. the uh, the points I would agree with Sadiq is about people dividing uh, due to nationalism. Us in the Labour Party are focused on actually building people across in, in political education to actually recognise the class structures. And that's why we offer a way forward through 
through a socialist, a social democratic view with the new federalism. But don't you understand why these sort of remarks infuriate people in Scotland, in particularly in, in the SNP? Nicola Sturgeon, again to quote, says it's sheer desperation and moral bankruptcy on the part of Labour. Well, I understand perfectly why Nicola admires me. What I think she needs to recognise is that post-Brexit, uh, post-Trump... The truth about the Scottish Nationalist Party is that they have one aim. They want to do, destroy the United Kingdom. 